And I am really pleased to announce our next speaker, who um, is probably best known for being a uh, Debian project leader, but has also got his fingers in many other pies, which are really fascinating that have to do with uh, interdependency of software and other sorts of very cool things. But I think you really want to hear what Stefano Zaccarelli has to say about the community. Thanks, Paul. Hi, morning everyone. So yeah, I've been a Debian project leader for three years, since last April. So what I'm going to talk today is about some of my experiences in dealing with specifically legal issues, but as you know, they also have quite a bit of policy implications. So it will be partly a kind of a didactic talk in how we do things in Debian from a legal standpoint on different pillars of what is called inappropriately, but still uh, intellectual properties. And on, a other, on a, another direction of the talk, I will share some lesson learned that might be useful in other communities, at least in communities which are in some sense uh, related to Debian. So um, let's start with some uh, fundamentals of Debian. I believe everyone in the room here knows what Debian is about, but just to recap some of the points which will be relevant for my talk today. So Debian has existed for more than 20 years now. Uh, it's very well, uh, it's very popular in terms of the, the technical product we make, the Debian operating systems. So we are kind of the uh, currently the web server market lead. So the the, the most popular uh, operating system for web service on the web is, is Debian today. We have a huge archive with something like 30,000 source packages, no, 20,000 source packages and 30,000 binary packages today. 12 architectures. And um, what's interesting for from the legal point of view as well is that we are. Uh, the basis for more than a half of the existing distributions according to, to Distal Watch. Uh, what's interesting for us today as well is the, the social contract, which is kind of an agreement between people making Debian and the uh, outer free software ecosystem. Um, in there, you will find that Debian promises to remain always free software, and I will come back to that in a moment. Uh, you will find a culture of not hiding problem, which, as I mentioned yesterday, initially was for mostly technical things, but have evolved into a more radical culture of transparency in all aspects and decision making in Debian. And you will find some provision in how we deal with non free software, which is still very distributable by our users. All this kind of ethical connotation of the project have been uh, useful in making Debian a very popular project for volunteers. So nowadays we have something like 1,000 official members of the Debian project, so people who get to decide uh, where the project is going, people who get to decide who is the Debian project leader and vote in a general, let's say, referendum within the project. And something like 5,000 other volunteers contributing in, in other ways, but not being committed to be members of the project. Um, we are often credited to be one of the largest, possibly the largest, uh, free software project in terms of official members. Um, so there are three fundamentals on how we do things legally in Debian which we want to discuss. The first one is the DFSG, the Debian Free Software Guidance, which you're probably familiar with. What's interesting here is that essentially you cannot promise to be entirely free software unless you also define what you mean with free software. So the DFSG is actually the interpretation for Debian of what it means to be free software. So there are sort of guidelines which you <coughs> apply to licenses of software, not to software itself, or more specifically, which you apply to the rights that you have uh, when uh, downloading some specific software. And in there, you will find essentially the, even if it's written rather differently, you will find the four freedoms they need to uphold for something to be cons considered free, free by Debian. You will find some distribution-specific provisions, like what it happens if you put unrelated software on a CD or on a DVD. Do they contaminate each other? So you have some technicalities to deal with that. Uh, historically, they've been the, the basis for the open source definition, which is essentially uh, uh, a more or less direct uh, reformulation of the DFSG in a more general terms, so not for distributions. And what's interesting, they've been interpreted over the years by the Debian project as applying not only to software, but to all sort of content we have in the Debian archive. So this is very interesting for me. I'm kind of, I'm kind of very proud of it, because in a sense, that makes Debian an even more radical institution than the FSF when interpreting what rights do you have on non-software content. So recently we now have this free culture movement, so all the content you find in Debian is essentially free culture compatible. 
And uh, this means that we face some kind of challenges when dealing with content which other distribution which only focus on software maybe do not face. Um, what's important here, another point, um, Debian is de facto one of the three major bodies that people look up to when deciding if something is free. So if there is a new ni license published tomorrow, li luckily the, the license proliferation problem has been slowly fading away, but if, if a new license pop up tomorrow, people will essentially look up at the FSF to know what they think of the, of the license itself, uh, of the OSI, and likely they're also going to like up is Debian saying that this license is free or not. So we are kind of a reputed body in the area. Um, second point, which is fun second fundamental of how we do things, is governance. So on paper, and in some sense also at the reputation level, uh, Debian has a reputation of being very bureaucratic, very formal, with a lot of decision-making processes and so on and so forth. We have bodies, formal bodies, like the Debian project leader, the technical committee, uh, like general solution. And it's, it looks like it's very bureaucratic, but in practice, on a day-to-day -day basis, we are almost an anarchic project. So we have clear areas of, of, of responsibilities, we have maintainers for individual packages, and those maintainers can do essentially whatever they want as long as they stay within some common agreement upon quality requirement for, for their packages. So we have like uh, hundreds of teams, we have thousands of maintainers for different parts of Debian, and they essentially are all autonomous. So they can decide on a lot of matters for their software in a very liberal and independent way. So third point, before moving to some specific uh, lesson learned, it's independence. So uh, I often claim that Debian is uh, uh, essentially very far away from risk of corporate controls. The reason why I claim that is that there is no single company babysitting Debian. So if you look at the competitors of Debian, other distributions out there, in almost every case, you can pinpoint an individual company which is either fully sponsoring the development of the distribution, or at least it is financing completely the infrastructure of the distribution. So maybe there is a real community of volunteers working on the distribution, but if the infrastructure goes away from one day to another, well, that distribution will have a problem. And again, this is not the case, so we have a lot of companies donating to us, we have a lot of volunteers donating to us, but they kind of balance each <coughs> other. Formally, there are no employees of the Vision Project, so they are not even dependent on the money we have to do their job. They might have employees that are interested in them contributing to Debian, but we have a quite kind of a very diverse range of companies paying people to work on that. So I think this is truly remarkable among, the, let's say, major or widespread distribution today, but it also has drawbacks, especially in the kind of things we're going, we going to discuss today. In particular, it means that we do not have direct access to typical corporate resources. For instance, we do not have, you know, Debian lawyers. We do not have uh, IP boards that can review what's going in, in the distribution and what's not. And all this kind of typical structure that you have in corporate projects, we do not have direct access to it. So we need to, uh, to um, cover up on that front in other way. Um, uh, what else? So this is how we essentially we, we work with respect to outer corporations and the outer financial world. And in terms of assets, we do have money. We use money for you know buying machines, for sponsoring hackathons or sprints or whatever uh, you want to call them. And those assets we have are essentially spread over several organizations. So we have several so-called trusted organizations, which the Debian Project trusts to all money and other assets for, for the project. Okay? And they're kind of scattered around the world. So the one we use the most is in the US, is SPI, Software in the Public Interest, which has actually been created for the needs of Debian, but then has become a more like umbrella organization for other projects. Uh, another one we use quite a bit is FFIS in Germany. Then there is Debian CH in Switzerland, and a uh, recent addition to the, is not yet a, a trust organization, but is, uh, is on track to become one, is Debian France, in, uh, founded by Debian developers in France. So we have this kind of scattering to reduce essential, essentially single point of failure risks. So having assets spread over several organizations, it's we are more like, uh, um, we believe our assets in, are more reliable than if it were in a single entity. Um, Okay, so this is the, uh, the way uh, we do things. So there are some consequences of, of all this. So first of all, the consequences are not necessarily Debian specific. 
So you will find other communities out there which have similar traits, okay? So I'm not gonna claim in that the, the lesson learned that I, I'm gonna show you today can, you know, port it natively to other communities, but it is possible that similar communities have similar uh, traits and similar consequences. So the, the most direct I, I face myself is essentially the, the typical approach, top-down approach of saying to developers, you shall do this or you should not do this, simply don't, don't work. Okay? Because they are not employees, so the usual you know, um, um, incentive you can give to people do not work, so you cannot just say to someone, I'll double your salary if your salary is zero, right? You cannot say to people, you know, I will gonna fire you because that's not how it works in volunteer community. So if you, when you uh, talk with the corporate world, they, have this, they, they might have this kind of incentive that simply do not work in that. Uh, it also means that we have limited access to legal advice, so we had to, to cover up in other ways in finding out how to deal with legal issues. And it also means that we suffer of some sort of uh, US centrism in how we interpret the law. Because essentially, being Debian historically a project born in the US, you know, originally, even though today is a very you know, worldwide community, uh, and being that the, our principle, so the, the, the trust organization we use the most, is software in the public interest, we have more access to US specific resources such as uh, interpretation of you know, budget constraints or legal advice, is mostly US specific. So we, we might need to, to evolve there as a bit, little bit. So let's see, considering all this, which is a kind of uh, overview of the structure of Debian which is relevant for legal issue, let's have a look at some specific legal concerns. Uh, we have faced in the past. So it's organized along the three axes of, uh, of intellectual property. One is copyright, another one is patents, and another one is trademarks. Okay? So uh, in terms of copyright, the concerns that a distribution has are quite different from the concerns that a company or a corporation might have. Okay? So the main things you need to do in a distribution like Debian about to copyright are one, keep Debian, Debian main archive, 100% free software. There is, there is no legal obligation for us to do that, but it is a committed we have made to this free software ecosystem. So this is the point one of what we need to do in terms of copyright in Debian. Point two is to keep the Debian archive legally redistributed. <coughs> so side by side to the Debian archive main, we have packages we support, but which are not free software, encountered and non-free, and even though we do not make any promise that those packages are free software, in fact, most of them aren't, if not, they would be in main, Okay, we need to ensure that they are legally redistributable, so that they, we can distribute them via our mirror network. Okay? And there is another concern that is typical for, uh, for companies, for corporations dealing with free software, which is copyright assignment, and that is not a, partic of a particular interest for that. So we do, at the present, we do not have interest in you know, collecting copyright assignments, even though we have something to think about offering the option to developers along the lines of the uh, fiduciary li license agreement that we've been discussing in this room yesterday. So the first question is, how do you do review of copyright notice and of license notices in a project which is shaped as Debian is? So the first lesson learned here is that you essentially don't do that in an anarchic way. You cannot simply you know, enable all developers to just have a say on reviewing copyright notices and copy and so, uh, copyright notices and license notices, and just trust that everyone will do the right thing. Okay, this is our experience. Why? Because essentially, at this scale, you will find someone who either don't, do, does not care at all about this kind of stuff, so it will be kind of of sloppy or reviewing it. Okay, and essentially, you will find out that for many actors, the legal part of free software is just a burden. They're not really into, you know, nitpicking at the license level. They find a software, they want it to make it useful for Debian users, and they just want to, you know, even take short shortcuts with that available. So what we put in place is essentially a multi-tier review process for the software that gets into the archive. So you might have heard about the FTP master team, you might have heard about the new queue in Debian, and this is a kind of a package qualification process for uh, copyright notices in the Debian archive. So it works this way, essentially you have an upstream software, you will have a Debian maintainer which find the upstream software and decide to you know, prepare a Debian package for it. And uh, the first time this package prepared by a Debian maintainer will go through the Debian archive, it gets 
essentially stop in a staging area, which is called the new queue, for the new package queue. And at that level, we have a specific team of people in Debian. Who we, uh, there are people that do a review, a thorough review, of all the copyright notices and all the uh, license notices, and check that Debian maintainer has properly noted down in a file called Debian copyright all the license and copyright information. And at the same time, they check that the Debian copyright files are complete, and they also check that the licenses are actually com compatible with the Debian free software guidelines. So this happens only at the time of the first upload to the archive, and subsequent upload just go through direct to the archive. So why, it, it's, we, why do we have this difference? It's essentially a trade-off. So in theory, you might want to have you know, multiple reviews at every single upload, of the fact that the licenses are fine, that we didn't forget to add a specific license, but that will be a, 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 a very high burden. So there's a trade-off in which you say, okay, we do that at a new package, and then of course if we find bugs later on, we, we you cope up with them. Um, so this is working quite well for us. It can be used also for other kind of uh, license and legal vetting. It's mainly used only for it's mainly used for uh, copyright and licensing notice, but it could be used for other stuff and also for I get to that in a second and also for uh, package quality uh, checking and for consistency of the namespace. Yes. So how do you deal with a case where the package maintainer decides to add can you repeat the question? So yeah, the question is, how do we deal with the case where the maintainer decides to add extra dependencies? So this is the granularity of source packages. So if there are dependencies, those dependencies <coughs> are on other packages that may be part of the same source package or not. If they are part of other packages, well, the other packages will are either already in the archive, so they already went through this process, or they will get in the archive later and they will go through this process as well. Yes? Can the maintainer ask for another review at some point in the future? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think we have a process for that. It surely can. The question is whether you know this kind of uh, vetting team will have the time to do it. the original upstream packets change. Of course. Okay, no, no, you, you're, you're absolutely right. So with, that happens, for instance, when you change name. So if you change name of the package, that will happen again by default. Yes? Just out of interest, is, is also part of that FTP master approval process some kind of assessment about whether the software is actually useful to anyone or... I perceive a mild troll in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's do, a very do, good do question. You, do you have requirements like that or not? Because I so, can see where you might. No, so there, there, there are ex the no legal requirement we have on this is actually to keep the namespace sane. Because if the FTP master will deal with the namesays of Debian packages, so what will happen is that they will they can debate well, cannot this package be part of this other package which is already in archive? But that usually happens way before this. So before preparing a package, we have a process in which the maintainer must you know declare they're working on something, and at that level, if the name is incredibly silly or the package is too small or if it's already at work, people will be essentially uh, right. called so up. So that happens before. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, then I should really go on. Otherwise, go ahead. Um, something really what we uh, talk about. Uh, the first talk today was about SPDX and explaining how that could smartly automate the cold stuff. Has that been looked into that? Yeah, I have come. I can do that in a bit, but it wasn't the first talk, so you've been uh, oversleeping, I think. <laughs> 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 me too. It was the first talk for me as well. So. <laughs> yeah. So I'm confused. Where does Debian Legal fit into this part? Yeah. So I, that's, a, that's the next slide. I have it. Says, we I did have not plan to draw. I have, I have, it, too. I have it too. I have it too. So important part here before I get back to SPDX and that is that essentially the FTP master team is de facto the team deciding which licenses are free or not free for Debian. So they are deciding the official interpretation of the Debian free software guidelines on behalf of the Debian project, and they are trusted by the project to do that. Okay. So we try to document these kind of decisions, but as Fontana often points out, we are not that good at documenting them, but we are trying to, to improve that. So there is a wiki which is essentially still quite empty, but the idea is to have the, you know, cross-referencing all licenses we have in the archive with the actual decision on their freeness or not. So we are trying to improve on that, but what is important to realize that is that the FTP master is the gatekeeper of, freedom, of license freedom in that. So, um, so once you have all this, okay, you kind of start asking yourself some questions. Okay? So when you have something as big as Debian, which is, in my opinion, very representative of you know, the popular and representative free software out there, you might want to ask yourself, okay, so let's assume 
it's an hypothetical that Debian decides that you cannot link together OpenSSL and GPL licenses. Okay? Uh, do we have in the archives software doing this? And can we decide if that's the case by just looking at the metadata? Or you might have related questions. You might have, okay, what happens if we GPL switches from GPL2 to GPL3, and how many GPL v3 incompatible licenses do we have in the archive? It was a question which was quite popular in free software circles in 2007. Or again, let's assume that some low-level library, say libberkeleydb, get relicensed to a GPL by someone. Okay. So what happens? How many packages in the Debian archive get automatically re relicensed to to a GPL due to this change? So you cannot decide that on a mere, you know, looking just at the package metadata, but you can help it to, you know, uh, uh, have a look at specific cases. So the idea there is that if we have all the Debian corporate information, okay, and we can and we have the dependencies. So we might look at packages that might link together during their compilation process software under different licenses, and we can use that set, a set of packages we need to you know inspect manually to realize whether we have some of these problems. The requirement to do that is that you need to have Debian copyright information in a machine parsable form. So Unfortunately, the initial Debian copyright, the initial format for the Debian copyright file was not machine parsable. So we started moving to that in 2007. There were some early version on the Debian wiki of a proposal, and it has been standardized only starting from 2012. So we now have a Debian copyright format, which is fully machine parsable, okay, and which looks like something I put on this slide. So it's essentially a Debian a typical RFC 2A22 format in which you have some specific fields in which you can say, well, these files in this package are under this license and this is the copyright author, and these other files are under, under a different format. And there are various interesting things in there. So essentially, um, uh, you have uh, um, globbing to match files, you have short licenses, okay, short license names, and you have the ability to add, you know, uh, natural language text blocks in this file to add additional information on the license or to include licenses which are, no, are unknown to the form. Um, if you want to have a, a real example, which is larger than the example I have, you can look at the LibreOffice Debian copyright file, okay, which is already translated to this format. It's kind of big, as you might imagine for such a project. Uh, it's kind of something like one, uh, 1,500 lines. Okay? And if you look in there, the largest part of the file is essentially verbatim inclusion of licenses which are either unknown, okay, meaning that they are not known to the uh, ontology of licenses known to the format, or which are known, but they are not you know, uh, considered popular enough in the Debian archive to be included in a directory which is user share common licenses where we include verbatim all the, uh, ver uh, all the uh, licenses which are very popular in the Debian archive. And everything else, about 2,000 lines, are globbing and you know, matching files to specific copyright information. So it's still pretty manageable, even though it, at this scale it can be uh, intimidating at first. So um, I think this is very interesting for free software in general, because in Debian you have a lot of files, or free software source code files, which have been already reviewed at least by the Debian, the Debian maintainers, and starting from the official declaration of the upstream authors about their copyright and their license. So it can still be, you know, incorrect information, but it has been reviewed at least by two parties before entering the Debian archive and before reaching the users. So this is a potentially a huge corpus of license and copyright notices reviewed by two tires, which is available for everyone to use. But to make it, to profit, to profit from it, you really need to have you know, archive coverage and have all Debian copyright files in this format. So this is just an idea to the kind of coverage for this format we have in the archive, yes? It's uh, still optional to use this format, right? Yes, it's still optional. So, so this really is just, to, to we, we haven't, the coverage a lot. of course, we haven't yet you know, mandated to Debian people to actually convert to this file, which has been some resistance. But even though it's not mandatory yet for people in Debian to do that, it's gaining momentum. So in 2011, at the time of the squeeze, there, there really is only 20% of the packages in the archive were in this format. Uh, in, uh, at the time of the Wizzy release, it was 42%. And now, the snapshot of the uh, seed distribution I took a couple of days ago, it's something like it's very close to 50%. So it's gaining momentum. I think in the end, it will be uh, available in this format for everyone. But even if it's not complete yet, you can use it. Um, someone asked about SPDX, yes. This huge corpus that you have is available under which license? 
How old? Ah, that's a good impression. So we, that's a good question. So right now, I think so. It's not a corpus in the sense that it's aggregated anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so right now there are just individual metadata under the same license of the package usually. Well, the Debian maintainer can declare a different license for the Debian information, but by default we don't do that. So by default it's usually an individual metadata under the same license of the source file. But you're right, if you aggregate it somewhere, it should be exposed to something like the ODBL or something like that. I will be working on that, so I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, uh, last thing about this, someone asked about SPDX. So I know about SPDX. The goals are kind of different. So SPDX is mostly for uh, companies and for people that are having to do some bill of materials of the software they are shipping to users. While I, in my opinion, Debian Copier, the machine readable Debian Copier is more like a format for hackers. So it's an intentional format where you use globbing to minimize the, you know, the size of the uh, license information, where in SPDX you have an extensional form, whether, where for each file you need to specify what license is under. So essentially it's, it gets so big in SPDX that you need to use software to deal with it, while Debian copyright and machine principle is meant to be used by, by humans. Um, it's also my understanding that SPDX is meant to be mostly machine readable, while you can read it as XML, but it's not particularly easy to understand, while Debian Copper is meant to be both machine readable and human readable. That's absolutely the intent with SPDX, is to be As well? both machine and human readable. Yeah, you consider that today it's machine readable? Excuse me? You consider that today is machine readable? It, sorry, is uh, human readable SPDX? Yeah, I mean, there's conversion tools to do that, but they come, the project is, you know, that's under the umbrella of the project. But the intent, I think the intent is yeah. not. Well, I, I was the one who started the, the SPDX project, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that. Okay, but that I mean, if you have convert, It's not the case today, okay, but that was the original intent from the So we're going to agree on that. Okay. We have to uh, talk about SHA-1 sums also uh, later on. <laughs> <laughs> So there are some so but there are some compatibility about between the two. So for instance, we have compatible license names. So there are specific provision in the machine principle uh, Debian copyright format to be compatible at the license name level with uh, SPDX. And there are some prototype tools to do the mutual conversion between the two. Unfortunately, they're not here pack properly packaged yet, but they exist. Uh, back to Debian Legal, is that actually a comment I forgot to make on this slide? Thanks, Karen. So Debian Legal mailing list is not the official Debian position licenses. It's just a forum where people who like licenses and not always have a clue about them discuss <laughs> things. Okay? So it's essentially a, the Debian legal community is not the community that does the final say in what is free and what is not free for Debian. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. So what else? So this was about copyright. Second point, which is very popular in uh, free software circles in the past years, it's about patents. So, um, like every very big software assembly, Debian is a patent minefield. Essentially, every big collection of software is potentially a patent minefield. Because patents brands are, are pat because patents are so broad that you can actually patent everything. Maybe their patents are invalid, maybe they're not, but you can patent a lot of silly ideas that you can find in any, every single software if you look uh, hard enough. So as everyone else in the area, Debian did some risk assessment for patents in the in Debian archive. Um, we've learned quite a few lessons on this. The first lesson we learned is that FUD and Hysteria has basically won. So we are living in a world with respect to free software and patents where people are really scared about the most common offenders. So the, the, the patents that make the headlines on the, on the tech newspapers. We are really scared about those and you essentially ignore other areas that might be there in free software, very likely are, which could be very risky from a patent standpoint. Okay? So essentially, it seems to me that FUD and the people who are shouting the most have been able to set their agenda on how free software communities are dealing with patent. Okay? So this is the first lesson we have learned. I believe that this gives us some, <coughs> something like it's a false sense of security because communities feel you know, on safe ground if they stay away from the common offender. Okay? But maybe they are in danger for other patents which are less known to the big public, okay? but which can be a real danger for the community or for the companies involved with the community. Okay? So in the specific case of Debian, this is what has led to the Debian Multimedia 4. Okay? I encourage you, your, you today to have a look at, again, if you're using Debian Multimedia, if what you need is or is not in the Debian archive, because it's very likely that you do not need that fork anymore today. So this is the first lesson. So Hysteria, people shouting the most, and FUD has really made a dent in, the, in our community. <laughs> the second lesson we learned is that the 
typical requirement of you should not speak about this in public. Simply don't work. Simply doesn't work in our community. Okay? It's fundamentally against the, the ethos of free software communities that want to talk to each other. And usually they're public mailing is to do so, so they will do that. So just saying you should not do this is not going to work. Okay? So we work on this not alone. So it's not, as, as I mentioned, we were not lawyers, we are geeks. We have scarce access to legal resources, but we have been lucky enough, being a big project, to work with institutions like the Software Freedom Law Center on this kind of stuff. And we try to create training material and reusable material on patent matters and other matters like trademarks, okay? which is reusable for other community and possibly which is not only US specific. Okay? As Tom Calloway mentioned yesterday, well in Europe we like to live in this dream in which you know, software patents is not a problem for Europe, but that's actually not true. There are various sneaky ways to have patents on software in Europe as well, so the danger are not only for our US friends, there are real danger also for people in Europe. So we discuss our needs with the CFLC and produce at least a couple of documents which might be useful for other communities. The first one is the Community Distribution Patent Policy FAQ, which is, contains essentially training material on what patents are, what infringing a patent means, how you can disprove that you're infringing a patent. And this is all general material on, on patents, specifically on software, but on patents also uh, on, uh, on other, in other fields. This is very interesting. I think it's training material that everyone interested in the subject should read. And it also contains stuff which is specific to distribution and distribution which are community driven. For instance, it contains a review at the time of publishing of how many you know, law suits you have, had around, you have had around community infringing patents and so on and so forth. And I encourage you to look at that. The second document we publish is the Debian position on software patents, okay, which is something that we hope it's, uh, can inspire other communities to take similar stands. And in there, you will find as well teaching material, and you will find the, the claim against FUD on patents matter. And if you, fi you find encouragement for communities like, you know, please refrain from discussing specific patents in, publi in public because it's dangerous to you. Okay? I know it doesn't work, because in Debian it doesn't work, but at least we're trying to educate hackers in our field and also in other communities. We need a lot more. Yeah. Could you put a, a filter on all the Debian mailing lists that automatically diverts the moderation of the new message containing the word So the question is, like can I filter the Debian mailing list so that if there is a patent in the subject or in the mail, you get the refuse? No. No, I no, it goes for moderation. I goes for moderation. Yeah, so you can then email no, that, that and say, look, are you really sure you want to do no, that? that won't fly in Debian. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but it's potentially a proposal that we can, uh, we can uh, think about. So similar to this, we have face similar issues in trademarks, okay? So, as many other projects do in free software and old South free software, we do own a number of trademarks. In particular, in the case of Debian, we own a trademark on the Debian name, and we own a trademark on the Debian logo, this way, okay? Uh, we have been discussing this with communities since, like, the first discussion about this, I think it dates, like, 15 years back or something. And the feeling I have every time I've discussed these matters with the communities, in communities like Debian, is that communities are viciously against patents. At least the free software radical communities like Debian. Essentially, there is a feeling that we are doing this for software freedom, for enabling people to do whatever they want with our software. Why should we restrict on the basis of naming? The analogy with censorship is something you will find very often in public threads between hackers on this subject, and it's something which is really hard to, 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 uh, to debate. So, as an example of this, if you look at the Debian Free Software Guidelines, you will find a specific trademark position, provision. It doesn't mention trademarks, but the, the, the intent is pretty clear. So essentially, the, the point is integrity of the author's source code. And in there, you find something like license may require derived works to carry a different name. So it is required to force people to change the name of your software if you do changes, for instance. But it also notes that this is a compromise. The Debian group encourages all authors not to restrict any file, source or binary, from being modified. So back in the days when the DFSG were drafted and they are approved, you see already this kind of tension. You see people that says, okay, we can accept if your software is trademarked, we can accept if you, you want to defend your name, your identity will change something, but we notice that that's a compromise. And this is something very symptomatic of the kind of culture that you find in free software communities against trademarks. Um, 
I find that it's very hard to explain the risks of trademark infringement to, to communities like Debian. I myself believe that trademarks are very useful in communities like Debian. And the arguments that I found work the most, that they work better, are the argument in which you show that trademark infringement can actually go against the community ethos. For instance, in Debian, you can imagine having people trying to take Debian, uh, fool it with uh, proprietary software, spyware, and distribute it to others, calling it Debian. That's an argument that will make a dent, with the people will perceive as something which makes sense. I think that you gave a, last year you gave a talk uh, licensing from the trenches, right? Yeah. To the Mozilla case. And that I think this kind of stories you have in Mozilla is something that will take will talk quite a bit to Debian. Except that we, we haven't yet uh, seen them for our product, so people are not uh, aware of the risk you have in, the, in terms of trade on the I mean, in the last two years it's become even more. So the only reason that we have any entry at all into the mobile phone market is the power of the Firefox trademark. That is what, that is the only leverage we have with carriers and that is why there are now 14 countries and 17 carriers ship shipping phones which are running much freer <coughs> operating systems, maybe one day truly free operating systems, and that's what's carving a path possibly for truly free operating systems to run on mobile phone hardware, right? This is right. an enormously good thing for the free software community and the only reason it can happen is because we have the Firefox trademark. And therefore it seems odd to me that people think that maintaining the Firefox trademark is a bad thing and they're not interested in any software that bears it. It's you should come great. talk to my community yes. as well. Yes. <laughs> I have on several occasions. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, I, I've had sort of a little, I've noticed this viscerally against trademarks, um, notes of that, not nearly as much as you've had experience with it. And, I, and I find it a bit puzzling as an attorney because if you, uh, if you just, and I wonder if the, the key thing is a lack of understanding of the intent of trademark law and how it mm. works, because your good argument is the argument for trademark law Absolutely. regardless of who, who owns a trademark. I mean, that is cutting right to the intent, which is, you know, really protecting the you know, consumer or, in this case, the person receiving Debian, you know. As so I, I totally agree, yeah. and in fact, my point is that we need more training material also on trademarks. So, uh, I have so some Cam's examples. Speaking later about yeah, that. exactly. And then I, I believe Pam will be. When you say communities tend to be viscerally against trademarks, one of the things I, I wrote a paper a few years ago, and I spent a fair amount of time looking at the Debian um, uh, Debian. The list. old, the old one, you mean? Uh, the, the old one, yeah. yes. Uh, and um, but one of the things I found was people also viscer viscerally reacted very strongly when they thought there was an infringement. So they're actually, I saw, I saw both sides of it. I saw the people who were very against enforcement trademarks, but I also saw people who didn't, I think they reacted on a very emotional level when they saw, when they saw something that they thought was an offense to the Debian sensibilities, the Debian, and they'd be like, oh my God, why are they using our trademark? And someone, sometimes would respond and say, because they're allowed to, because it's under a license. But, but, I did, but, but it is, I, I like the word visceral because I think it's true, but it's also true in both yeah. directions. Yeah, this could be its own, its own talk and you've only got 10 minutes. So. No, no, all right, okay. So I uh, wrap up here wrap, wrap quickly. So um, this was an example of the uh, old Debian trademark policy that Ben was discussing. So and it's really not a trademark policy. It's something we have been using for like almost 15 years. And you find there a very vague sentence. So you, you have an example like, for example, if you make a CD of Debian, you can call that product Debian. But if you go down, you have restrictions like, to be fair to all businesses, we insist that no one other than Debian uses Debian trademark in the name of the business, organization, or domain name. And here, you might notice that there is no mention of a product at all. So that, that's that's kind of weird, right? So the, I think it's true that is, there was not really a, a clear... Is that intentional or a mistake, do you think? In I think it was a mistake. I wasn't around in 1998 when this has been uh, created. I think it was a mistake due to another look of not only trade, how trademark works, but also what is it, it, it main point, right? Okay. So uh, I need to be quick now. So uh, we changed that. So we, we've been working on a notion developed initially by uh, Mako and Greg Pomerath. The idea is trademark freedom. And it's a new trademark policy based on a few principles. The first one is that we want to make trademarks as free as possible. And this is the, the origin where you have some tension between hackers and, uh, and trademark lawyers. So essentially, we want to push the limits of how far can we go in giving freedom to people to use our marks without losing the, the, the right to our marks. And of course, it's not clear cut, right? So the, there is also a different risk you take depending on how you move on that spectrum. So the second interesting principle for me is that for a free software community, you really want to have your mark to become 
as popular as possible, of course, within limits of not giving up your rights. Why? Because people are doing this to, you know, to promote free software, because they believe in the value of free software, and it's their interest to have their marks as widely used as possible. A contentious case, which is very important for Debian, is, for instance, giving the ability to other people, to third-party vendors, to make commercial merchandise using Debian marks. Because for us, they're doing, uh, they're doing us a favor, popularizing Debian marks. Okay? And this is clearly a point of tension in people that have been doing, uh, looking at trademarks for, uh, from a different point of view. And also you find in there stuff like uh, making easy for people like the Debian project leader or the responsible for the uh, Debian assets to keep up with day-to-day -day trademark infringements, day-to-day -day trademark requ uh, requests and so on, license requests and so on and so forth. And you find a new trademark policy here. It's been in effect since January last year. I think it's a pretty decent policy, and it's been using as the, it's actually been using an inspiration for other communities. For instance, the Tor community looked into it with interest. Um, you, it's been referenced in some uh, legal uh, journal that it was unfortunately under a paywall, so I can't <laughs> <laughs> look up <laughs> the article anymore, but I find it references a good example. And we definitely need more refer reference, trademark material, more educational material on what trademarks are about and more template-like material that we may use to create trademark materials. So in that sense, I really would like to, to point out the related work by Pam. I think you will be talking about that this Actually, afternoon. Actually, that's not part of my talk. Oh, no, sorry. So, I will, so thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, so that's the <laughs> trademark modeling guideline. The idea is to provide actually template guidelines you can use for actually if you want to create your the trademark policy for a free software project. And that's the thing that's very useful and we need more in that direction. And another good example is the new Wikimedia trademark policy, which is more restrictive of what we have in Debian, but is actually uh, a very nice example of how to communicate the do's and don'ts. So it's very visual, I think it's very immediate to grasp, and it's a, it's a very nice way to communicate what the community think is fine and what the community think is not fine with respect to their goals. Uh, so that's it, essentially, for my talk. I just have uh, some concluding thoughts. So in a community like Debian, we have had this, like copyright issues, trademark issues, patent issues, but you have had much more, okay? So I've been around for about 12 years in the Debian community. I've seen in the past US crypto exploitation issues at the time of the crypto wars. I've seen the MCA issues. I've seen the, the problem of dealing with countries which are considered embargoed by the US. Can we accept their contribution in terms of code? Can we not? I've seen problem about inbound trademark policy. For instance, uh, there is a kind of a mean for me, can, if you recompile something from source, and that's something you are recompiling, it's a trademark on his name, does recompilation invalidate nominative use? That depends, so that's a question that communities like Debian really face, and they don't have a clear answer, possibly because it does not exist a clear answer in all cases. Mm -hmm. We have a trademark trolls. So we have trademarks, we have people saying, hey, in, uh, in China or Malaysia or uh, in somewhere else, people are trying to register a trademark which is similar to yours. Maybe it's not even true. We want to pay us this amount of bucks to inhibit them to do so, this kind of, and they're not legitimate requests. We have quite a bit of trademark trolls doing these kind of activities. Uh, we've been working on copyright assignment to nonprofits because when you have a community which is as old as Debian, 20 years, for instance, you will have people that will die. So maybe they will want to uh, assign their copyrights to people that will take care of their code contribution after they passed away. Or maybe just because they want their copyright to be enforced, right? like what they were saying before. And so on and so forth. So I think we really need a, a mutual dialogue between communities and free software lawyers because we have to deal on a day-by-day -day basis with all this kind of stuff and they really impact the policy of your project. So my wish list in, in legal matters just as a, as a dream for, for you to, uh, to, to maybe join. Uh, we do really need more, false, more free software legal education material. We have some in the realm of copyright, we have some in the realm of patents and trademarks, we need more. Because geeks tend to think, software geeks tend to think they know quite a lot mm -hmm. of legal issues and that's actually not the case. Okay. And they, they risk to take shortcuts which really harm the community by doing so. We need more community-oriented legal templates like for the trademark one, like for patents, like for uh, copyright uh, inbound policy, and all this kind of stuff. We really need template materials that we can reuse, maybe under, possibly under legal advice, because you cannot easily transfer templates from one case to another, but it's a starting point. We really need more fiscal sponsor organization and organization like the Software Freedom Law Center. There are organizations in which they try to work 
four communities pro bono and try to have models in which it is sustainable when they make sustainability for the pro bono work charging clients that are doing you know um, business work around free software and you will really need more of this kind of institution not only at the US level we need something like this also at European level and finally we need less laws that punish typical activities for communities okay for instance it's really against the ethos of free software communities that merely knowing about something merely knowing about a patent or merely discussing in public about something it's making the situation worse from a legal standpoint that's really harming the communities, and my dream is that we will see these kind of things going away. Uh, we need less people spreading the SUD, including lawyers. Typically, we have an agenda for some uh, corporation in uh, corporate interest against free software. And because, in fact, SUD really works. So when people are seeing lawsuits which are working in some area, they're starting to think they can affect their work as well. So it's really work, and it's really impacting the choices the communities do. And that's it. So if you have a question, I'm happy to take one. Yep. Um, I'd like to have first one small remark on trademarks and then the question. Uh, the short remark is that I think uh, it's important to, to realize that you can use trademarks uh, in an evil way or in a good way. Like, for instance, uh, in copyright, GPL uses copyright actually against copyright. Of course. You can do something similar to trademark that you can use for uh, consumer protection, right? Uh, but the question is, um, the FSF holds a list of three new slash Linux distributions. Uh, Debian is not listed there, and honestly, their reasoning why Debian is not listed there uh, seems to be quite weak uh, to me. Um, is Debian doing something uh, about that? Like, any FSF board, board member in the area would want to take the question? <laughs> so, so that's really not a question for me, right? So that's more a question I for... I mean, the question is, if Debian is taking this... Yes, issue. we are working on this quite profitably with the FSF. We've been, we've been collaborating with them on this issue for the past two years, if not three. So things are going forward. So that's the, the, the answer to your question is yes, we're working on that, and we're quite happy about the relationship, but it takes time. Okay, Changing this kind of policy decision takes time. On trademarks, just uh, I want to uh, comment on your comment. You're right, trademarks can, can be used in bad faith, but a lot of things that distribution are doing can be used in bad faith. We are recompiling the software you are using. You know, we can make mistakes or we can add backdoors. In some sense, we are trusting the Debian project. So if we do trust the institution as Debian project, and the Debian project trusts some specific organization to all their assets, including trademarks, well, this is the kind of trust you can count on. Uh, so, in the, the human readable copyright uh, data, have you thought about moving that to the software packages instead of having them, or sorry, to the software projects, and then maybe the work could be shared with other uh, GNU Linux distributions? Right. So, uh, so it is part of the software packages. So, for every single package you install, you have the Debian copyright locally. And we thought about sharing them with other institutions. I oh, think it would upstream. I think you were seeking upstream. Yeah. Uh, upstream. Uh, well, if we found discrepancy about our findings mm -hmm. on copyright licenses and what Upstream is claiming, that we, by default, we you know <laughs> fall back, we forward the information to Upstream. That's part of the. Uh, but, but I mean, you know, if Fedora might want to use the same data you know, rather than two distributions. Right. So I'm, i myself working. I've created a project called sources, sources.debian.net in this year, which is exposing all Debian sources via web with some API to work on them. And I'm working on exporting all the machine parsable Debian copyright information for others to use. And and there will be an API. So I, I'm personally working on that, but there is not something that can be easily used yet. But I mean, it's all free software, right? So in theory, every other distribution can already download the Debian copy and use them. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I, I agree. I know I will not go as far as saying that the format with, which we developed for our needs it's potentially a good format for upstreams as well. I believe there are other things like the, the, the description of a project. Maybe they include some copyright information, so they can use it. I don't. I'm not sure it could be the, the, the good format for people other than that. Yes. Uh, 
We have about one minute left, um, and I have a question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 I've used the power. Stop Take taking, all the time. Stop right taking the time. Stop taking the time. Okay, so uh, so I've heard rumblings recently about people who are concerned about uh, participants in communities like Debian and being confused about whether people are representing their companies or representing their personal views, and that that's having a deep impact on the governance of the project. Are you seeing that in Debian, and how is that going? I don't think it's getting a deep impact. I think I know what they're referring to. I don't think it's having it's a deep impact. It's actually multiple situations. Okay, but in fact, I want to know data about how much do we have corporate influence in Debian. I think the <coughs> Debian model should be like the Linux model, in which you have enough different companies contributing to the project to actually balance their interests. One thing I'm working on is a survey of Debian developers to ask them who they're working for, or at least how much time they're spending doing you know, Debian in their work time and their free time, and actually see if we can you know, have some factual data in how interests are balancing that. So I don't have a good answer. My feeling right now is that no, it's not impacting a lot of governments, but it might be, and I want to have data on that. I would follow up with one point. There is a big difference between you and Linux, though, is that in Linux you've got a very small collection of people who are making a lot of the final decisions. In Debian, you've got a thousand or more package maintainers, and if one of them has an agenda, they will make their decisions based on their agenda. Yeah, I'm not it's saying it's happening. I'm yeah, just, yeah, there sure. There is a significant governance difference. You have also there. a very different granularity, though. So right. the the the, imp the the scope of the impact of decision in Debian correct. is much smaller than That's in correct. Linux. So yes. it's yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.